This is a man who's made and lost zillions of dollars in normal commerce. He's done that in businesses as varied as restaurants and telephones and who has chosen to spend that money and his so-called retirement years by opening a nature conservatory in Langley, British Columbia. He and his wife look to preserve endangered species and this is not a zoo that they're running. Their intent is to release these creatures back into the wild. Thank you very much. What a, what a pleasure it is to be here today and speak to you. So how does a 56-year-old man, glasses probably half empty, first time in my life I've probably said that, but uh, I don't think I'm going to live to 112 somehow. So the glasses got to be half empty. So how did I get interested in this? Well, you know, as a boy growing up in the prairies in Canada, I used to bring home all kinds of orphaned animals. They probably weren't orphaned, but I brought them home anyway. <laughs> Baby fawns, bears, gophers, squirrels, raccoons, hummingbirds, birds of prey. And I had a very supportive mother. I raised them in the home, and then we released them. And that was my first experience raising animals. Weren't endangered then, but are today. As I started to need a mentor and go through my life and start to develop as an 11-year-old, I had the great privilege of having a gentleman by the name of Dr. Stuart Altman who lived across the street from me. And he was an interesting gentleman. He was a primatologist. He trained chimps for the space program. But he was up in Edmonton teaching at the University of Alberta, and he took me under his wing. And he introduced me to Al Oming. I don't know if any of you know who he was, but He's the first person in this country that really ranched animals, wild animals. I had the great privilege of learning from Gerald Durrell. And if you haven't read his books, I suggest you do. They're just magical. Of course, he's gone today. Another Englishman who I got to know quite well named John Aspinall. And John started two very interesting zoos in, in uh, Europe. After learning from these people, uh, it was time to go on to college. And what does a kid do? But I wanted to be a veterinarian. And you know, the first day at school, they said, who's in pre-vet? And the whole class put up their hand, and I quickly looked around and took mine down, realizing I wasn't the brightest person in the room. And at that point, they took two people a year into veterinary college from British Columbia. So at that point in time, I went into wildlife, finished my wildlife degree, went on to start a master's PhD doing embryo transfers back in the late 60s, early 70s, a long time ago, and uh, decided that in the cusp, or the middle of the Arctic, wasn't where I wanted to live. So I went and did a business degree. Well, I live in the Fraser Valley of British Columbia, God's country, and development was starting to hit that area. Lots and lots of development. And just the massive destruction of our environment. And I found it very, very frustrating. So we went and bought 135 acres of land in the temperate rainforest of British Columbia. Beautiful piece of property, lots of springs on it. Lots of natural wildlife. We have uh, everything from um, fish that spawn, salmon, coho, chum, steelhead. We have four types of owls that live on the property. These are wild. Eagles nest on this property. Um, we had two black bears show up last year and hibernate there. It's pretty cool in your backyard. We also have some very endangered species because as the valley has been developed, most of the habitat has disappeared. One in four mammals that are alive in the world today will be extinct in the next 15 to 20 years. That's pretty frightening. One quarter 20%, sorry, of the world population. 10%, one in 10, of every bird that's alive today in the world will be gone in the next eight or nine years. This is a crash that's getting worse and worse and worse. It's almost like a vortex, like you flush the toilet and down it goes. That's what's happening with our wildlife. And our zoos aren't solving the problems, and nor are our leaders. You may find at some of these zoos that the management offices and uh, operation centers actually have larger budgets than what the animals are getting. It was a real privilege and a delight to be part of it and to have been uh, witness to it and experience, uh, experiencer of it. And what I'm going to try to do today after I show you a little bit of film footage is I'm going to try today to explain to you why we're doing things differently and how we think we're going to be able to make a difference. Our planet, we know it's in trouble. 
We know that animal species are disappearing at 50 times the natural rate of extinction. We know that the complex ecosystems that sustain all life on Earth are starting to break down, and yet we feel helpless to prevent it. People don't even want to talk about environmental issues. They find it too upsetting, too depressing, because when they ask, well, what can I do? The answer seems to be not much. But here in the Fraser Valley in British Columbia, one man has come up with a better answer than not much. Gordon Blankstein is fighting back, and he wants you to join that fight. When I was a young boy, I, I used to bring home any orphaned animal I could find, robins and squirrels and hummingbirds and baby deer, and, and I'd raise them and re release them in the fall. And that was kind of my introduction to a natural release project. We don't have these animals for display. They're basically here. This is a breeding center. We do guided tours, but other than that, it's off public display. Right. And that's why we've been so successful in uh, building up the population so we're able to send them back into the wild. Have you ever heard of Afghanistan? You know, there's a war going on there now. Well, they use these guys for target practice. So they're almost gone. There's maybe less than 100 of them alive today in the wild. We hold a quarter of the world's population of Cuviers in the captive scheme of things and we were able to send back 10. This is what it's all about. We're able to send back whole family units. Oh, that's interesting. Nobody else can do that. They just don't have the space and they can't focus on one species or two species or five species, which we do. Our gear is really towards making things as natural as possible to encourage real natural behaviors in each species. They're not here as our you know, indefinite wards or for us to display. And Gordon's whole philosophy is we send these back. We want to get all these other countries passionate about their national treasures and, and start their own projects and get us involved. What my wife and I are dreaming about is, is the pass off of this facility to the next generation, to families, to business people, to corporations that all recognize the need and, and the responsibility to save these animals. This is a world issue. It's an issue that we want to get people to embrace, and we're really proud to pass it off and have it get much, much larger than it is today. These guys give you 100% of their trust. They, they don't have anywhere else to put it. The best zoos in the world think this place is pretty special. What a... Thank you. Thank you. What I'd like to do is, is try to give you some ideas of how we're different and how you can make a difference. First of all, we're talking about survival of the species, not individuals. So you're a Mr. Zoo director at the Bronx or Toronto and you have a pair of gazelles and you breed them and guess what? It has a boy, the first offspring. You say, oh my God, what do we do with this boy? We don't need it, we need herds of animals. And you stop breeding them. That's not our approach. We breed our animals, we build herds up, we make matriarchal family units, which is how they live in the wild, and we can turn them back to the wild. And when we turn them back, they don't disperse. They stay together because that's the way they live in the wild. And how did we learn that? Again, simple business approach. When I started a business, I went and did research. When I started this facility, I went and talked to the people that were the experts in the field on the individual animals. You noticed in the video that I'm very hands-on with the animals. And you say, boy, oh boy, that, that looks a little strange. Why would you be doing that if you're going to release them back to the wild? But let's think about it for a minute. Most animals in captivity die from something that's stress-related. So if I can take the stress out of those animals' lives by having them comfortable with me, having them comfortable around the people that are taking care of them, they don't catch these diseases and they don't die from things that they're dying from in zoos. When it comes time to release them, we send them to isolated parts of this conservation center and they turn wild real, real fast, I assure you. Some of the other things that really bother me is there's a certain amount of money that's available for conservation. I'm going to tell you about a marmot project that we're involved in. And the federal government decided that this species at risk, uh, the Vancouver Island marmot, was indeed worth protecting. Only survives in Vancouver Island. Um, its plight was due to logging. Uh, once we logged the island, 
Um, the deer population does very, very well in logged out areas, so we change the eco balance. They take off. The wolf population takes off because there's more deer. The cougar population takes off because there's clear cut golden eagles come in that didn't historically live there. And the trees now grow back up 25 years later. The problem is there's now no food for all the deer that are there. So the deer are now disappearing. As the deer disappear, the problem becomes what do the predators do? They eventually die out, but they don't die out quickly enough. So they attack a marmot, which is not their historic prey. So we need to bring them into captivity and we need to breed them. We built a nice natural enclosure for the animals. We put stumps in it, rocks, things they're going to see in the wild. And it took us two years to get marmots. They needed homes for them. They needed space. But the scientists said, ah, you can't take an animal out of the wild. It's too dangerous to do that. What if it died on the dirt and on the stones and on the rocks and on the trees that it's used to living in? We're going to put it in isolated facilities, cement floors, cement walls. They brought them to Toronto. They put them there. They, they, when they went into hibernation, they put them in deep freezes. Nothing natural about it. And they got no production. They sent us, you know, when it was our turn to get our share of the animals, we got post-reproductive female. We got a female that just came out of the wild and a pair that spent six years here at the Metro Toronto Zoo. And guess what they did? They produced offspring. Not one year, four years in a row, five years in a row. It's absolutely mind-boggling. Why is that happening? Because we're not letting science go wild. We're not in probing them. We're not in doing studies on them. I don't know how long it's been since you've been to a zoo but uh, there's some wonderful facilities around. You may find at some of these zoos that the management offices and uh, operation centers actually have larger budgets than what the animals are getting. You may also find that the multi-million dollar facilities house two animals. That's not what we need to save these species. We need an army of people out there, like-minded people, that believe this planet is being destroyed. We didn't inherit this planet from our parents. We're trustees for our kids. And I find it absolutely mind-boggling that we can be so greedy as a society. And I've been there. Guys, I did the 600,000 air miles a year. I ran corporations in 65 countries. But we can be so greedy as to destroy something that God created. It's not us to, uh, up to us to take those animals' lives. We have the responsibility to protect them. I ask you, as you look forward in life to getting involved, not necessarily just with us, but find projects where you can get involved and put your money to work. I thank you very, very much for having me. It's been a privilege to talk to you. Thank you, Moses. Thank you very much. Excellent.